I'm going to introduce briefly Taryn, and I was, I was joking with him. My son is a, a Chai Hike alumni graduate, and we're never supposed to talk to or about Menominee High School football or baseball players or hockey and anything like that. But, and all kidding aside, uh, Taryn's had an awesome opportunity as a, as a sports athlete to take it to the next level. And uh, he's got some family here, and he's going to share his story about his journey. So let's give it up for Terry. Thank you. As you guys probably know by now, my name's Taryn Vavra, and as Rich mentioned, I'm from Menominee, Wisconsin. Currently, I play for the Colorado Rockies, um, and I just want to say uh, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, I was originally supposed to come in and speak in November. Uh, some of you may remember that. I think Keith reached out to me way back in May or April um, and explained that he wanted me to come in November specifically um, because uh, Steve Foster, the Rockies pitching coach, was coming in in December and he wanted it to be sort of like a Rockies one-two punch uh, for you guys to hear. Um, so that was the plan, but in September I was invited to a fall development camp uh, that the Rockies host in Arizona and it just so happened to put, take place in the month of November, so I wasn't able to. But Keith was very understanding and just so happened that this day was open. Um, and I said that, you know what, that works, that works for me. Um, but I wanted to get a little bit better sense of what I would be doing here. I didn't really have, uh, you know, a good idea uh, how this operated. So Keith suggested that I come and listen to Steve. Um, and I thought it would be a good opportunity not only for myself but for my brothers and my dad uh, to listen to another baseball guy's story. So um, we came over and... Um, I'd met Steve before, uh, one time in a spring training game, I was playing with the big league team for just one game and I think our conversation was brief, it was about a handshake and a good luck. So um, didn't really get to know him all that well, but I shortly realized in my time here uh, last month that on top of being a major league baseball coach, Steve's also a professional motivational speaker. I mean, if you guys were here last week, or last month, um, you guys know. The, the stories that he told and the passion that he kind of told those stories with, uh, it was really cool to hear. But I knew I had a tough act to follow after that. Uh, I knew that right when I was walking out, and my brother Trey, who was here, he just looked at me, started laughing, shaking his head, and said, good luck following that. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to try my best to, to come up here today and follow in his footsteps. Uh, but I think it's important to mention that this is my first time doing any sort of speaking like this. Um, I've never spoken uh, to a group to this size. Uh, I've spoken in front of teams that I've been a part of, in classrooms, and even to some discipleship groups before, but never to a group this size. And at first the thought of doing that was kind of intimidating. Uh, you know, getting up here, speaking in front of a group of men that are mostly older than me um, and have a lot more experience than me. But I've realized that I have a pretty unique story to tell and one that some of you may want to hear. Um, and I've been fortunate to have some success early on in my life that have helped me, and there's been some things that, go, that have came with that that have helped me get those successes. And I think that a lot of the stuff that I'll be presenting today, it doesn't have an age limit. So once I started seeing it this way, I became a lot more excited, and again, I'm just really happy to be here. But I mentioned I was down in Arizona for our fall development camp, and I'm sure a lot of you guys probably think uh, it was all about baseball. Um, but it really wasn't. Um, when I got there, um, I was expecting, you know, baseball, 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 as, was, as were a lot of the guys. But I realized quickly that the, the Rockies had this camp um, for another reason, and that was to work on two things that the Rockies felt they were lacking throughout their organization. Those two things were leadership and teamwork. Don't get me wrong, we were on the field, you know, the first half of the day, but in the second half of the day, we were in the classroom. We were talking about stuff um, that had to deal with leadership and teamwork. So we really broke down. We went through books um, as, a, as a group. Um, we, had, we listened to different motivational speakers that came in and told their story and um, how uh, leadership and teamwork apply to them. And then as players and as coaches, we all gave presentations um, on different leadership traits um, and so forth. And Honestly, I'm, I'm glad that I was able to go to this camp before I came up here and speak because it prepared me better. It gave me um, a lot, of, lot more information that I want to share with you guys today. So 
I mentioned we went through a book down there, and the book is called Pulling Together. Um, it's by Keith, John Murphy, and um, it's a really easy read. I'm not much of a reader, um, and I'm sure my brothers will have a snarky comment to say about me not graduating college. Um, but this is a super, super easy read, uh, regardless of your reading level. So definitely recommend. I think it was 80 or 90 pages. Um, not hard. But the focus of this book was teamwork. And you guys might not think that teamwork uh, really relates in this sense, because it, it, it's something that you know, just re relates to athletes. But really, it applies to us all. We're all part of a team. Right, whether we review our family, our friend group, um, our work community, our church community, whatever, we, we all belong to some sort of community that can be viewed as, as a team. So this, this book, kind of some of the stuff they were talking in there applies to us all. And you'll see it says 10 rules for high performance teamwork. So the book's broken down into you know, 10 chapters or 10 rules uh, to achieve uh, high performance teamwork. And I'm not going to go through um, all these rules, but I do want to go over a few quotes that really stuck out to me. And you'll see the first one up here. It says, our mission in life is to offer our gifts to benefit one another, to create mutual gain in the world. There's a simple life lesson within that quote. Put others before yourself. Use the, use the gifts that you've been given to help the person next to you. Um, as an athlete, we oftentimes hear, put the team first. And honestly, I think it's an easier thing to do in that setting, right? Work hard for your teammates, work hard for your coaches so you can accomplish your goals, so you can win games, so you can win championships, and so on. Um, but it's, it's harder to do in our immediate lives when we may not know the outcomes that we're working for. But it really shouldn't matter. We shouldn't focus on the outcomes. We should rather focus on working hard for the people around us, doing everything we can to help our teammates, to help our friends, to help our family members, and so forth. Um, think about those people in your life, the people that work hard for you, right? How valuable are they to your team? Um, they're the leaders a lot of the times. They're the ones that are vital to the team's success. And the book does a good job later on summarizing how important these people really are. It says, look alongside every achiever and you will find caring people offering encouragement, support, and able assistance. That's definitely been the case for me. And the success that I've had so far would not have been possible if it weren't for the people that have been around me. And uh, they're a large part of why I'm here, and that's really where my story starts. I was born in May of 1997 into what some may call a baseball family. Uh, my dad was a manager for the Los Angeles Dodgers uh, minor league team in Yakima, Washington at the time. And my mom was a full-time mom. She's homeschooled my two older brothers who are here today, Tanner, who was seven at the time, and Trey, who was five. Um, and that's kind of how we operated for the first few years of my life. We traveled with my dad as he coached, and he came back to the area in the off season. But in 2002, my dad took a job with the Minnesota Twins to be their minor league field coordinator. And it was about that time that we found a full-time home in Menominee. Um, my mom went back to teaching. Uh, my brothers and I were both enrolled in school. And it was also about that time when we all, all of our family kind of fell in love with the game of baseball and started really diving into it. Uh, but with my dad's new position came a lot of cool opportunities. We'd get to travel around to different minor league affiliates with him and um, watch the games, get to meet the players, go on the field, be in the clubhouse, maybe have a few snacks at the concession stands. We were living the life, but we didn't really realize that even cooler opportunities were coming. In the fall of 2005, my dad took a job with the Twins to be their major league hitting coach. And it was, it was a huge deal for us and our family. My dad never made it to the big leagues as a player, and some of you know his story, um, but this was sort of his call up. And our family was super excited for him. But it was a little bittersweet for my brothers and I because you know, my dad sat us down and he said, you know, things might not be the same. Like We might not be able to go on the field. We might not be able to interact with the players as much because this is the major leagues, right? These players are at the highest level and we don't want to be a distraction for them while they're trying to work. But fortunately, the Twins, as an organization, not just coaches, not just players, front office, everyone, they all valued family, and they encouraged us to keep coming around. So our opportunities got a little cooler. We started you know, doing the same things that we'd been doing in the minor leagues, but now we're doing with big league players. You know, as my brothers were getting around the high school age at this time, so 
their summers were filled up with various different, you know, sporting events or uh, activities, whatever it was. But for me, who was, you know, 9, 10, 11 years old, my summers were wide open. So I'd go every chance I could. And I'm sure my dad got sick of me, but I think it was the summer of 2009 um, when the Twins last year in the Metrodome. And uh, I think they have 82 home games in a, in a season. And I think I was there for about 40 of them. I went every chance I could, and why wouldn't you? Be around some of the game's best players? Uh, how cool opportunities is that? But the Metrodome, in particular, was awesome for me and my brothers, because you know the players might not have liked it as much because the facilities weren't great, but for us, there was only one cage. So um, both teams had to share it. So when we went up with our dad, we get to be in the cage, watch the Twins players as, as they hit, um, we'd get to hit in between, and then the other team would come in, and we'd get to watch them hit. So we got to be around all these players, and eventually we started getting to meet some of the opposing players even, and it was just a crazy cool opportunity for all of us. And some, some memories there we'll never forget. When the Twins moved to Target Field in 2010, it was again one of those things where we, you know, kind of bittersweet. It's like, oh, you know, we were... We knew that the, the cages were going to be attached to the clubhouse. We knew that each team was going to have their, you know, their own cage, so we're not going to get those same opportunities. Right? And our dad kind of sat us down and again and explained. He goes, you know, we're not, you know, we're not guaranteed that we're going to be able to do those same things we've been doing. We, you know, we're, the cages are attached to the clubhouse now. There's no guarantees. You can, these guys can just hang out in the clubhouse during the game. But again, the Twins valued family so much they encouraged us to keep coming around. And now we start building relationships with players and they wanted us to keep coming around. So our opportunities kept getting cooler. Now Target Field, obviously at the time, it was top notch, top level facility. Um, you know, and, and for us it was top notch because now in the cage they had these big comfy chairs and the snack room was even closer, <laughs> right? So that was our dad's rule to us. As long as we helped out the players, pick up the balls, put the balls on the tee for them, and stayed out of their way, then he'd hit with us, and we could help ourselves to the snacks. So, sounds fair to me, right? <laughs> but at the time, my brothers were starting to get older, and they were starting to get into their athletic careers, and they were really starting to take off. Uh, they both played football, baseball, and hockey in high school, and they were studs. Um, Tanner was all-conference in three sports. Trey was all-conference in baseball and hockey. And uh, they both went on to play uh, junior college baseball at Madison College. Uh, from there, they both earned Division I scholarships uh, and were drafted out of there by the Minnesota Twins. So as a brother, right, I really looked up to them. I saw their success, and I wanted that. Like, I wanted to be just like them. Uh, I wanted to full, follow in their footsteps specifically because I didn't want to be the brother that didn't play three sports in high school, that didn't go to college as an athlete, that didn't get drafted. Right? So I put a lot of stress on myself at a pretty early age. But fortunately, my brothers instilled in me that, you know, rather than trying to perfectly follow in their footsteps, I should, you know, establish my own. And it's like when you go hunting with the, you know, and I went hunting with my dad when I was younger. Uh, he'd instruct me to kind of follow perfectly in his footsteps when there's snow on the ground so I didn't make any extra noise. Right? And so that's what I would do. I'd try to, you know, step perfectly in his footsteps and I'd end up tripping or falling. And it's the same thing that I try to do with my brothers. I tried to be so methodical and so perfect stepping in their footsteps uh, that I'd probably end up falling. And I remember two times when my brothers really instilled in me, you know, follow your own path, right? They made a path but take your own footsteps along their path. And the first one was when I was a freshman in high school, going into my freshman year. I was uh, going through uh, one of the toughest decisions at the time, which looking back isn't that big of a decision, but I was trying to decide if I was going to play football or not. I liked football, but I was small. I mean, I was a shrimp. I was like five foot three going in, in my freshman year and uh, an average athlete. And I'd heard all the stories of people getting hurt and people missing out on different you know, sport activities. Um, so I was just really contemplating whether or not I'd make this decision. My brothers played, so I thought I needed to play. Right, And I remember sitting in my kitchen with both my brothers and really asking them what they thought. And they both had, something, they both had the same thing to say. And it was something along the lines of, what does it matter what we think? You have to play because you want to play. You have to play because you have a passion 
for what you're doing. The second that you start playing for any other reason but that is the second you start risking your, you know, you risk, put yourself at risk of injury. The second you put yourself at risk of uh, wasting your time. And that conversation really opened up my eyes. And it made me understand that, you know, I was on my own journey and my interests might be different from what they were, theirs were. Without that conversation, I don't know if I would have made the decision not to play football. And if I wouldn't made the decision not to play football, I wouldn't have put all that time and that extra time and energy into my hockey and baseball career. And I don't know that that 5-3 shrimp would have went on to be a four-time all-conference baseball player, an all-state baseball player, uh, all-conference hockey player, and a captain of the hockey team. I can't say any of that would have happened if, if it wasn't for that conversation. Um, but there's another time that they really encouraged me to kind of take my own steps. So, and that, that was when I was deciding on where I was going to go to college. You know, as I mentioned, I was a late bloomer. Um, so a lot of my recruiting process didn't really start until later on in my high school career. And it was in April of my senior year, I was offered a scholarship to the University of Minnesota. And I remember not being looked at by a ton of schools, but there are a few schools interested, and one of them was Madison College, where both my brothers went. And honestly, that's where I kind of figured um, I'd go. Right? They, they went there and they loved it. So, but when Minnesota offered me, I immediately you know, called everyone. My mom was with me, so she you know, was up to date on all this stuff, but I called my dad. And you know, my dad was very supportive and gave me the, you know, whatever you decide to do, we'll support you, all that stuff. But I was looking for a little bit more help. I was looking for, you know, tell me what you think I should do. And so I called my brothers and they both had the same thing to say. They said, do it. I was like, what do you mean, do it? How can you say that so easily? Like, you guys both went to Madison, why wouldn't I do that? Like, you guys loved it, coaches were great there, uh, great program, you guys went to the Junior College World Series, all this stuff, why wouldn't I do that? It worked out for you guys. And I remember them, you know, really saying, it doesn't matter what we did, what matters is what you're going to do going forward. We worked our butts off for two years at the junior college level to get this type of scholarship that you were just offered. Minnesota has a great program, great coaching staff, and it's a great school, and it's close to home. So get your foot in the door, work hard like you always do, and it doesn't matter where you go to school. And that kind of opened my, my eyes, right? It didn't really matter where I went to school. I knew that I was on my own journey now, and I was gonna be the one who had to put in the work to get where I wanted, not my brothers. So I went to school at the University of Minnesota, um, won two Big Ten titles, won a regional championship, was named first team all Big Ten, was named first team all American, and was drafted in the third round by the Colorado Rockies. Now all those things were stuff that my brothers never did, but I wouldn't have either if I wouldn't have had that conversation with them. And they didn't push me to go in my own footsteps, make my own set of tracks. Looking back, this is all kind of familiar. It's the same, same thing that God's done for all of us, right? He sent Jesus down to make a path for us to follow. Now, we aren't perfect. We're not going to be able to walk in single file right behind him. But God knows that. They're his footsteps. They're Jesus' footsteps. We're not expected to follow perfectly in them. Otherwise, we're going to trip and we're going to fall. In Matthew 14, 31, it says, Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand, took hold of him, and said to him, You have little faith. Why did you doubt? Jesus is walking alone on his perfect path, but he always offers his hand to us to take it and walk alongside of him. You can't walk perfectly behind him, but, they, but God knows that. Just like I couldn't walk perfectly in the footsteps of my dad, my brothers, or anyone else. But what we can do is we can take their help when we need it, and they reach out their hand to us, and we need guidance. Going back to my time in Arizona, um, we had a pastor come in from one of the larger churches in the Denver area. He came in, told his story and whatnot, <clears throat> and he was a very inspiring man. But he ended his speech by saying, here are two things that will change your life forever if you can do them. He said, these two things will lead you to be happier and more successful without a doubt. The first thing is do what you say you're going to do. Don't make promises that you can't keep. Don't be dishonest with yourself or the people around you. If you focus on doing what you say you're going to do, you're going to be more aware of what you say, you're going to be more truthful, and you'll make much more meaningful choices throughout your life.
The second thing that he said, this is just care. Sounds simple, right? Almost too easy. But it goes back to what that first quote from the book said. Put others first. Think of your team before you think of yourself. When you invest time in others, they're going to invest it back in you. And this is an easy thing to do when you know, we look at our team to, to care for our family, to care for our friends, to care for our people at work. But it's more than that. It's caring for the people that you don't know, that uh, you have no business really being there for, right, in all honesty. And I have a couple stories that I want to share where I think two people who have no business giving me the time of the day really demonstrated a caring attitude towards me. And these are stories that I'll never forget. You don't really need sound for this, but you'll, you'll get the, the gist of what's going on here. get enough of them. So you may wonder how a guy who just got done reaming out that poor umpire, or those poor umpires I should say, is uh, you know exactly caring. But uh, Gardy is someone that we know personally very well, uh, that my dad's worked alongside of. Now my dad works for the Detroit Tigers, again with, with uh, Ron Gardenhire. When I was a junior in high school, uh, during my hockey season, it was like four or five games into our hockey year, I broke my arm. And I remember it was you know, really devastating because our team was really good and I was off to a really good start to the year and it was just a bummer. Hockey is one of those things that I had that passion for. I remember I had to stay in the hospital for I think it was 24 hours just getting my bones reset, getting it casted before I could get home. But when I got home, there was a box waiting on the front door. Uh, and the box had a card on top and the card didn't say much it was a get well soon card but it said keep your head up get well soon the guardies and I remember thinking you know it didn't matter what was in the box it's about the fact that he went out of his way to make sure that this card and this package you know were there when I got home so I could feel better he knew that I was going through a tough time and that I obviously was pretty devastated but he went out of his way to make sure that I felt better. And really, that's how we should care. One of the times that I was at the at Target Field, um, what I would do during the games is I would sit in the cage and I would watch the games on the TV, right? Because you couldn't, couldn't go out in the dugout. That was, you know, no-no. Um, but we could sit in the cage and watch the game on the TV. And usually whoever's DH for the game would come in while the team was out in the field and they would you know, either hit off a tee or get the machine going uh, and, and get some extra work in so they were ready to go for their at-bats. So it happened that Jim Tomey was DHing this game. And so he was in, he was always one guy that loved hitting off the tee. And it was kind of my thing, I would put the balls on the tee for him and help him pick up when he was done. And it was for, that was the case for everyone who was in there. Um, but during the game, he was most of the time the DH, so that's what I would do. And his first two at-bats, he didn't really do much um, in this game. And I remember he was hitting off the tee before this at-bat, and for whatever reason, he was walking out of the cage. I said, hey, go get him this time. Like he'd been you know, messing around all day, and he hadn't done anything yet. Like, go get him. I felt comfortable enough to you know, say something like that for whatever reason. And he looked back at me with a straight face, and he said, I'm going to get him. And so he goes out, and this is what happens. Okay. 
All right, so you guys saw what happened. This Goliath of a man hit a Goliath of a home run. He you know, slowly trots his way around the bases, um, gives his teammates high fives, the fans are going nuts. But what you don't see is after that, after he gets done celebrating with his teammates, as he comes running back into the cage, he finds that 12-year-old kid that, that's there, and he gives him a big hug and said, I told you I was gonna get him. You know, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is, you know, with all the people cheering, with his teammates going crazy, um, this is a guy that's hit over 500 home runs at the time, now 600, who's going to be a sure Hall of Famer, or he is in the Hall of Fame. The fact of the matter that he remembered that interaction with me before he went and did something like this and went out of his way, you know, to make me feel, you know, that sense of caring that, that he displayed. And sometimes that's how simple it can be, is just to remember or simply to uh, ask how, someone how they're doing. It can be that simple. Uh, caring can be that simple, but it's something that we can easily forget, especially when it's outside of our team. Um, now, these stories come from people of significance, but it doesn't have to be people of significance uh, that, that show caring, that have to show. It can be anyone. Anyone in here can, can demonstrate a caring attitude. But we can't wait around for someone else to do it. We have to initiate it. It comes from us. It's up to us, right, to do all these things, to put the team first, to walk, walk with the Lord, but embrace your own footsteps. To do what you say you're going to do and to care. Um, we can't wait around for someone else to do it. It's up to us. I want to say thank you for having me come up here today and speak, speak to you guys. It's been an honor. I want to thank you guys for listening. And I hope you have a great rest of the day. And God bless. We do have a little bit of extra time. Anybody have a question you want to fire in turn? Yeah, I've got one. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Dick Lining Google uh, from Chippewa Falls, and I've had the privilege of knowing the Vavra family, and your Aunt Joyce and I went to high school together. Um, my question is I had an encounter with your father, Joe, uh -oh. and it had to be <laughs> eight years ago. And I always asked, How are the boys doing? And at that time, eight years ago, Joe said something really interesting to him. He said, all the boys are doing great. I'm really excited about Taryn because I think he's going to be the guy to make it. What did he know eight years ago that you were going to be the one? Well, I, I think that in, in a large sense of it, both my other brothers made it too. And they've done incredible things. And they've kind of forced me to get to where I'm at. But... Honestly, I think uh, he, what he probably saw is how much I was annoying all those big league players being in the cage, taking their swings, and, and uh, you know, just watching all the games. But any time that someone's around the game that much, uh, they, get, they, they learn. They're, especially me at the time, I was a sponge. I was watching those guys and, and trying to you know, take everything I could um, to not only you know, help myself as a player, but to just learn more about the game. And I think uh, he probably saw that. Um, I was doing that, that I was trying to soak it all in, and I think that that's something that I'm very fortunate to have all those uh, experiences and take away all the things that I have. I think we call that passion. Mm -hmm. um, anybody else? Right. You mentioned a few smatterings of faith. How important do you feel that is, or your faith in Christ? <clears throat> to draw you to be more receptive, to be more uh, malleable, to, to, uh, to reach the perfection of what you see in your peers or your or the, the athletes that you uh, looked up to. Mm -hmm. was, that a, was that an important drive? Yeah, it's definitely. I mean, my, my faith journey is something that, you know, you guys all know, it's ever changing, ever growing. And, uh, you know, you see a lot of these players that I've shown are men of faith and uh, the way that they conduct themselves um, my dad and my brothers are men of faith, and the way that they've conducted themselves has really kind of, you know, showed me the path. And like I said, it's not necessarily about following perfectly in that path, but it's about learning from it, growing, and taking your own footsteps. And I think that's something that I'm still learning uh, in my faith, uh, is I have more footsteps to take in front of me. It's not something that ever really stops, so. Good question. Anybody else? There are more grandpas in here. But you're our dad. <laughs> <laughs> One thing to you, young man, 
and to those two guys in with you, the importance of your mother. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely a, a good question. My mom has been kind of the rock of our family. I said we, you know, we traveled all over the place, um, but she was kind of always consistent. My dad could be uh, in Elizabeth in Tennessee, or he could be in Yakima, Washington. Uh, but wherever we are, my mom kind of always instilled in us that you know home was where we all are. And um, she's been huge through the years. My brothers are obviously older, um, so. She, they weren't there to you know drive me to practices and whatnot as much. My dad was obviously traveling a bunch, so my mom had to had to take the brunt of it, and uh, she she always delivered. And she's been a huge part of not only my baseball journey but all three of our um, personal journeys as well. Good point. My kids will see it. My wife is legal and oddity, and I'm the entertainment director. <laughs> there you go. Mike. Um, so I, last summer I was in Asheville, North Carolina. I was drafted in 2018 um, and I, I went right away from there to Boise, Idaho and played a half a season there um, just because our college season kind of went up to the draft and then I finished in Boise uh, with the Rockies and then this past summer I was in Asheville, North Carolina and did pretty well there. Um, it's hard to say where I'm going to go. Uh, minor leagues is kind of one of those things. Uh, I, I mentioned the story that we were planning this speech in November um, but when the Rockies came calling in September, it's kind of one of those things where you have to, you know, when they say jump, you say how high, and you have to kind of go. So I don't know where I'm going to be. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing Lancaster, California, which is uh, advanced A. Um, otherwise, I'll be in Hartford, Connecticut, which is double A. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's not true. <laughs> because all the grandfathers are dead. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. I just like to tell people that Taryn was actually player of the year, the most valuable player in the league this year, where he's played. Well, yeah. I saw that. Well, I think you had one back there. Yeah, I think uh, that's one of the kind of beautiful things about baseball. Well, it's not so beautiful all the time, but there's failure so present uh, in the game of baseball. And uh, I mean, when you think about uh, how much failure comes with it, uh, it's something that kind of humbles you. And in uh, you know, in the faith standpoint, we're going to fail a lot. We're going to be failed way more than we succeed in, in our faith. And knowing that you know, I have the game of baseball that's kind of shown me you know I can fail a bunch. And still be successful. It's the same thing with my faith journey, knowing that I can, you know, I can stumble sometimes along this journey that I'm on. I can fall. I can sin. All that stuff, but uh, I can still succeed if I if I keep pushing. I keep working hard. Um, it's the same type of thing uh, in in my faith. You know, you talked about how your brothers influenced your baseball and sports career. How about your faith life? Yeah, they've been they've been huge. They've led the way. Um, you know, I watched them go through their their uh, journey uh, throughout high school, and um, we went. You know, we went to St. Joe's Church in, in Menominee, and uh, I remember. You know, a lot of times, wa you know, watching them go through their confirmation, watching them go through all that stuff, um, and and thinking the same type of thing. It's it's kind of crazy thinking the same thing. Like, oh, I want to do that, um, and that's kind of motivated me, honestly. And, as they were in college, going through their different um, discipleship groups that they were a part of, encouraged me to be in, be in uh, a similar one at Minnesota. And so, seeing all that definitely kind of you know gave me the same sort of desire to be like them. How do you maintain this faith walk now that you're moving a lot? You play a lot of Sunday games. Do each of your teams have chaplains, or how do you do that? That's actually a really good question. So baseball has a really large uh, 
group of uh, people that belong um, to faith. And they make it a priority that everywhere we go, no matter where in the minor leagues, as long as it's affiliated, there's a, a, what's called baseball chapel. And it's always on Sundays, no matter where you are. And uh, it's got a different message. And then each season goes through a different, like this, this season, uh, we went through Matthew. And that's actually where I found uh, the Matthew 14, 31. I've realized that, um, you know, those, those experiences, wherever we are, it kind of all brings us together and it all makes us feel uh, like we're at home. And so those, those baseball chapel services on Sunday, they're quick, uh, they're, you know, they're 20 minutes or so, but they're really, really meaningful because a lot of times on Sundays we have day games and we don't get to go to church. We have to be at the field at, you know, eight o'clock in the morning or nine o'clock in the morning. Um, and you, and you don't get to, uh, you know, go to a full church service. So those, as I've went in my minor league career, those experiences, those uh, you know, 20-minute sessions of chapel have, have helped me a lot. So uh, can you give us an idea of the unglamorous life of being a minor league player? Unglamorous. Yeah, that's one way to describe it. Uh, <laughs> crappy is another way. Um, um, yeah, no. Uh, Minor leagues is, it's tough. It's really tough. And it's something that I saw these two both go through. And when we were, my dad was with the, you know, twins as the minor league field coordinator, we got to see a lot of those players and all the tough time that they were going through. For me, it's been a little different. These two uh, were both late around picks. So, you know, the team doesn't have as much invested in them. So they can kind of feel like outcasts sometimes. Um, for me, I was a higher pick. Um, I haven't felt that as much. But there's, you know, certain things that, that don't change. And that's, you know, eight-hour bus rides after a 7 o'clock p.m. game, right? Driving from, when I was in Boise, we'd drive, uh, our closest trip was six hours away. And um, if we finished a game at, you know, 10 o'clock at night, we were getting to the next place by the time our laundry got done and, done and we loaded up the bus to go to our, you know, our next uh, series, we were getting in at 8 o'clock the next morning and driving all through the night. And uh, it's, it's definitely unglamorous, like you said. Um, you're not making a lot of money. Uh, you have to, you know, find living on your own. Um, people get called up. People get cut. Some of your best friends, some of your, your teammates uh, get sent home. And uh, you just kind of have to roll with it. And so kind of, kind of like my faith journey, when I stumble, you, you have to roll with that sometimes. You have to work to make it better. Um, and in the minor leagues, there's not much you can do to try to make it better. You can just work hard and uh, hopefully keep moving up uh, until eventually one day you, you reach the, the top. You know, I, I do. He's been huge uh, to give me where I'm at, but um, there's been times where I've kind of been tapped out of him and want to listen to someone else. So, uh, yeah. I mean, I think that goes with everyone here. We, you know, dad, dads can help you so much, but there's, uh, you know, they definitely reached a point where it's just like, all right, I've heard enough from you. <laughs> No, but he's been really helpful, and I'm, I'm very grateful for all the, the, the knowledge that he shared with me and my brothers, uh, and it, we wouldn't be here without him, so very appreciative. Else? I coach your dad, and you hit just like him. You do everything. Well, that makes sense, because he's uh, you know, worked with me for a long time. So, um, yeah, he, had, he's been, he was fortunate to have some success in his athletic career and um, you know it's kind of the same thing the way I looked up to my brothers is the same way I look up to my dad and uh, hearing some of his stories um, you want to you want to experience that stuff uh, for yourself and he's definitely propelled all three of us to be where we're at. I remember your dad telling me one time he could throw or in the paper it was yeah, that he could throw 75 mile an hour one hand and then Right, other hand, he could go like 90. Yeah, yeah. So when that was uh, one thing when he was a hitting coach, uh, he's a hitting coach again. But when he was with the Twins, that was one of the things that players liked is he could throw both ways. So if they're facing a lefty or they're facing a righty, he could he could do some short work. Um, I think he had something similar happen where he broke his arm when he was younger uh, and ended up having to learn uh, how to throw left-handed. And uh, it's funny because it ended up being a big part of. Uh, what got him the hitting coach job is he could do stuff like that. Why did you choose uh, baseball instead of hockey? Um, I was really good at um, 
No, I shouldn't say I was really good. I, I, I was doing okay at both. And um, hockey, is, I knew, is kind of a tougher road to follow. Um, and the, the steps might, might not be as clear. With hockey, you have you know, junior level. You have uh, um, maybe you know, there's only Division three and Division one levels of hockey. So I knew that that was a tough, tough road uh, ahead. And honestly, like I said, I was kind of a late bloomer. So uh, my skill set with that kind of developed later on. So by my senior year, I felt you know, pretty solid. But um, I didn't really get much recruited much for that. And, uh, I, you know, I, I was pretty comfortable with the game of baseball, been around it enough and did pretty well at it that that got me a lot more opportunities and I was a little bit more passionate about it too. I'm sure I'm glad I didn't have to decide on a professional career. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic stuff. Now, you know what else? Rich, I just want to say, I uh, appreciate the <laughs> but I want to say it, the Barber family, the character goes way back even to your grandfather. Knowing him, knowing your father, your uncle, Howard, how he played ball with my brother Terry, and that, and uh, again, this family is a, a family of character. And uh, proud to know your dad going back. I always kid, kid your dad, we flipped a coin figure out which one of us was going to go in the major league to the game. <laughs> <laughs> well, he got there. Tails never fails. Um, two things. There are some flyers up there about the uh, camps that you have available. Yeah, real, real quick. There's uh, two camps. One of them actually takes place in Eau Claire. Um, me and my brother started uh, triple threat training. Uh, it's basically started uh, as something for us to kind of help out uh, the Menominee area, um, you know, baseball players, because we, we felt when we were going through high school and, and even through the earlier stages of our life in that area, um, we didn't think baseball was really valued all that much. And we wanted to change that. And when we obviously have had the success we've had, we have a little bit of a platform and we can, we can help those kids. And now it's kind of expanding. We're all throughout the Chippewa Valley area. We're in. Uh, some parts of Minnesota and uh, we're really having fun with it but we're having a camp uh, this weekend in Eau Claire um, at the Eau Claire Youth Baseball Association's new facility and it's going to cover everything it's going to be hitting pitching defense um, and uh, we're really excited about that um, and then later on in the month we have we opened up a facility in Downsville Wisconsin just outside of Menominee and uh, we're having a hitting camp that is just focused on hitting it's going to be an hour long um, both of them, are, we think, a really reasonable price. We're not worried about that type of stuff. We want to get kids more in, involved in the game. So uh, if you know any, anybody, uh, we, we are starting at age 8, I think, and working all the way up till 18. So if you know anyone, have grandkids, kids, whatever, that might be interested in baseball or trying it out, softball too. Um, softball players are always welcome. So. Let's give it up for Terry. Thank you.